The following is a fan-based opinion piece. My Little Pony Friendship is Magic is owned by Laura Faust, Hasbro Studios, Hasbro Inc., DHX Media, and The Hub. Please support the official release. My name is Flyer, Didn't quite catch that. So, today's the day. After a long wait, Season 4 premieres today. And, you know, I totally saw it, because, you know, this is a live recording. Well, wasn't it awesome? With, like, a uh, Nightmare Moon and the elements of harmony and... Uh... <clears throat> anyway, my name is Sweetie Bloom, and welcome to my MLP channel. What will I be doing here? Well, I'm going to be going through every episode of My Little Pony and be doing... Well, a little bit of everything. I might analyze it, I might review it, I might talk about a headcanon, really anything that the episode brings up or inspires. One thing I should apologize for is uh, my computer hates me. And uh, some of the clips, as you saw earlier, are overexposed for no reason, really. Uh, some of the clips are fine, others are not, but I thought I'd apologize for the lack of quality now before you start bashing me later. So we're gonna get the ball rolling with The Friendship is Magic, or the first two episodes, the Nightmare Moon arc as a lot of people call them. Now what you probably saw from the title is I'm going to be defending Nightmare Moon. Not from a character standpoint, but from a writer's standpoint. A lot of people have accused Nightmare Moon of being a generic villain, and that's what I'm here to defend her against. She is not a generic villain. Why? Because she is a generic villain. I know it's a little confusing, let me explain. None of the villains from My Little Pony Friendship is Magic are original villains. They're all inspired by villains from other media. And I'll get to the others in due time, but for now, let's focus on Nightmare Moon. The reason Nightmare Moon is seen as a generic villain is because the villain she's inspired by is considered the granddaddy of all villains. When you think of the word villain, there might be a character that comes to mind, whether consciously or subconsciously. A character that you've known since your childhood. A character that has come to define what it means to be a villain. <laughs> Seize that creature! Stand back, you fool! <laughs> and I can't get through a sitting of the first two episodes without completing this line for Nightmare Moon. You little fool! Thinking you could defeat me! Maeve, the mistress of all evil! So Nightmare Moon isn't a generic villain, she's a parody of the character who has come to define villainy. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Maleficent was inspired by the Dark Witch from the ballet, which was in turn inspired by the fairy tale, which in turn was inspired by the constant struggle of good and evil, which was inspired by the daily struggles of life. The list goes on. There's nothing wrong with taking references from other media. What's interesting is that I've seen some people use some sort of checklist about uh, what makes a generic villain, and using that against Nightmare Moon to prove that she is a generic villain. I guarantee you, if you were to take that checklist, Maleficent would not pass it. But that does not mean that Maleficent is not a great villain. She is a great villain. Frankly, she's the one thing that people remember from that movie. And many people consider her the greatest Disney villain, considered to be the ringleader of all of them. But she is a generic villain by some people's definition. Now, why is that? I think, unfortunately, it's because people have made it generic by overuse. People have tried to emulate Maleficent because she's such a great villain, and thus these tropes have been seen throughout media and is now considered lazy writing. And that's fine if it's trying to hide it. I feel like Nightmare Moon is not trying to hide it. They are very explicitly making a homage to the greatest Disney villain of all time. The best example of that is actually the ones I've already used. The direct copy and paste lines and scenes from Sleeping Beauty. And it's these that I really think are meant to be a reference. And My Little Pony does that a lot. They make references to other media that at first you may not get. In fact, you can only get it by being a huge fan of that media. I've seen very few people get the Maleficent reference, especially the second one, because not everyone, frankly, is as diehard a Disney fan as I am. I caught it immediately, but not everyone's going to. 
and thus they just write it off as lazy writing, when in fact it's actually a reference to a great war. There's another reference actually made in the pilot episode that I didn't get in my first watching, and only when watching it a second time did I notice that they make a kind of subtle Sound of Music reference. She's gone! <gasps> now I'm going to try and head off a question before you ask it, trying to defend basically her M.O. Obviously, her motivation is something that is exceedingly unique in the sense that so much media has been made based off of this bitterness against her sister, this jealousy, and her wanting to spread her night. No one has a problem with that for the most part, especially since it's more implied than stated. What people sometimes have a problem with is her lack of execution, you know, setting up almost trials for each of the main six, which led to her default. I'm going to be honest, how my headcanon works is that that was Luna fighting from within Nightmare Moon, in that the whole 1,000 years of banishing her to the moon was a catalyst, making her weaker. You really think if you pick up a tool for the first time, you're going to use it like a master? No, you're going to be a noob. Similarly, the main six are noobs when it comes to the elements of harmony. They aren't going to be able to wield the elements properly, just like Celestia wasn't on her own. So they would not actually be able to purify her unless half of the work was basically already done for them, which is what the banishment was doing. Now this is 100% headcanon. I'm, you know, kind of making this up in order to uh, cover the plot holes, but honestly, I don't think it's even that bad because for me, that was what I assumed was happening. It's one of those things where I didn't realize it was a headcanon until someone brought it up. They said, well, why did she do that? Well, that was Luna, obviously, right? Didn't, didn't everybody get that? No, that was just me? Oh, never mind. Now, unfortunately, by admitting that this is a headcanon, I've kind of dug myself into a hole, as headcanons are usually only needed when the plot doesn't cover it. So yeah, there's a bit of a plot hole as to why she executed her plan the way she did. But hey, I'm not here to defend the plot, I'm here to defend Nightmare Moon as a character concept, more than how she's executed. That about wraps up my first video, so I hope you enjoyed it, and here's to more in the future. Brony on, my friends. We're sticking to you like caramel on a candy apple. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is no caramel in a candy apple. That's why it's a candy apple, not a caramel apple. Do you even know your trade woman? <laughs> I gotta say, I kinda identify with Fluttershy in this episode. Oh, you poor, poor little baby. Little? Oh, you're just a little, little baby kitty, aren't you? Oh, look at your little kitty. So cute.